Okay, good morning. Today we're going to conclude uh, our discussion of synthesis and talk about how nanotubes and nanowires are made and uh, relate that to methods of bulk production of these materials as well as methods of integrating them with uh, top-down methods, basically lithography methods. We'll have a few examples of that. Uh, my only announcements are, uh, you know, recall the, the upcoming due dates as well as please bring your video file on a USB stick on Wednesday. And uh, there's this thing about peer review of the videos and just to let you know, I'll tell you about that soon, so don't worry about that. Uh, on Wednesday, you'll also get your homework two back and we won't be able to grade homework two, before, homework three, sorry, before the exam, but I'll, I'll post the solutions for uh, bo homework three as well on Wednesday. And then re regarding question two and question three on the current uh, problem set, question two is talking about the, the nanoparticle growth in a solid uh, by diffusion. Uh, I will just want to let you know that you know, qualitative answers are okay for that question. Sketching the distributions and talking about why and how they evolve, you don't need to do any calculations. The same thing is true for question three. I want you to propose a process for how to grow these super lattice nanowires with different segments uh, and talk qualitatively what might limit the growth rate, the length, the diameter, and the other, uh, uh, the other characteristics. Uh, and and uh, you should be able to uh, formulate an answer to question three, if not already, based on the stuff we talk about today. And, and feel free to ask you know, questions directly related to that uh, if, if, uh, during the lecture uh, if you want. Okay, so last time we talked about the growth kinetics of nanoparticles and we adopted the model from Sujimoto that uh, let us understand based on diffusion limited and reaction limited growth regimes uh, whether the size distribution of the particles gets broader or focuses. And we came down to this uh, plot that basically says that if you're in a situation with a high supersaturation where the average size of the structure in your medium, for example in solution, is bigger than the critical size, it's mathematically, mathematically and chemically favorable for the size distribution to focus, basically for bigger particles to grow at a slower rate than, sm than smaller particles. So the smaller ones catch up to the bigger ones. And if you're in the opposite situation, uh, the size distribution broadens, meaning small ones shrink and big ones get bigger, and then the distribution broadens. So that is a practical aspect of how the size distribution of structures are controlled. And the exact value of this boundary may vary based on the particular conditions or may not be this, this exact. But what I want us to understand is how we come up with this answer and what its implications are for synthesis of different types of structures. And while this is a simple example of you know, a one-dimensional process, a perfect sphere, you can appreciate that there are a lot of uh, other uh, you know, limitations in real cases, particularly related to reactions that have numbers of steps or other shapes. But this generality, as we'll see today, can persist for, uh, for example, nanotubes and nanowires, considering how their sizes change during growth and also how the catalyst particle sizes behave during growth. And we'll see some analogies on that as we move forward. And then we also talked about uh, some you know, other methods that uh, nanoparticles are made uh, and, and tried to still hammer home this idea of separating the nucleation event from the growth event or the creation of your starting structures from the maturation of the structures to a desired size. And these snapshots were from uh, a different approach to growing uh, nanoparticles where uh, the chemical stability of a precursor was, uh, was controlled at two different temperatures. But we saw that this philosophy to separate the nucleation and growth events was very effective in this case. And in two limiting cases, when they ran their sort of normal process where they had a temperature of about 250 C to create the nuclei and say 320 C to boil the solvent away and grow the particles, they were able to create very monodisperse particles here as shown in TEM. But if they uh, left the material at the nucleation point, at the nucleation temperature for a long time, then they got a, a broad distribution of nuclei and that resulted in a broader distribution of particle sizes. So just to emphasize that these principles can carry through different methods and that can, as, a, as a guiding force for creating monodispersed structures of all different shapes and sizes and types, regardless of the particular conditions that might be necessary to do that. So today we're going to transition from uh, zero dimensional or 
you know, spherical nanostructures to one-dimensional structures, long and narrow structures, and we're going to specifically focus on synthesis of nanotubes and nanowires by CVD, or chemical vapor deposition, taking a gas phase precursor and decomposing it on a nanoparticle catalyst, where that catalyst acts as a template for the one-dimensional growth of the nanotube or the nanowire. And we're going to talk mostly about carbon nanotube growth and semiconductor nanowire growth as examples that are most accessible because there's been a lot of research done on them and also of application interest because we know a bit about properties of nanotubes and their conductivity and mechanical properties as well as the properties of nanowires as semiconductors. And we're going to go through a bunch of uh, topics uh, starting with the basic growth mechanisms from the catalyst particles. We'll talk about different designs for furnaces or growth systems and we'll talk about uh, the uh, way the catalyst behaves, how the structures nucleate, how catalysts are typically prepared, and we'll talk about aspects of growth of the nanostructures on substrates, how we might control their morphology, whether we're growing just one at a time, say across a gap, or a tangled film, or in a lined forest, and at the end we'll get into issues of the limiting mechanisms, the kinetics of the growth process, and draw some parallels to nanoparticle growth, We'll talk about issues of diffusion limitation versus reaction limitation and some topics about impurities and defects. And I'm not sure that we're going to get through all of these topics today. My bet is we'll end uh, and have to take up about half of the lecture next time and then we'll have the other half of next time's lecture on the exam review and then the exam of course is next Monday. And we're still working with the same set of papers that was posted at the start of lecture 13 and today we're going to be drawing from the papers highlighted in green down here, the Kodambaka and Hockbong papers on uh, nanowire growth, uh, as well as the Terranova and Wirth papers on carbon nanotube growth, in addition to, of course, a lot of other references that are always posted at the bottom of the slide. And then what I had in the extra section, uh, we're now referring to the references in blue. Uh, as I said before, you don't need to read these, but for example, the uh, discussion of the mechanisms of nanowire growth and the precipitation at the interface that we'll see in a couple of videos is the work by Hoffman on ledge flow controlled dynamics of silicon nanowire growth. <clears throat> so, you know, as we step through our, our category of building blocks, we now see, for example, how we might nucleate and grow uh, nanoparticles in solution or by gas phase methods. And, you know, we could imagine, uh, for example, by changing the precursor that we work with, if we grow a core, we might be able to grow another shell on the surface. A kind of example of a degree of freedom that we didn't really talk about, but you can imagine is possible just by changing the chemistry and having a growth of a secondary layer on an initial nuclei. And today we're going to move on to talking about you know, nanowires, which uh, will we'll, we'll draw the distinction between nanowires and nanotubes, where nanowires are generally structures that are solid, and nanotubes are generally structures that are hollow. This is a picture of a silicon nanowire uh, and its endpoint catalyst, or you know, the seed which templates its anisotropic growth. And this is a picture of a single-walled carbon nanotube and the accompanying TM, TM image where we see the one wall like so. And there are a lot of materials that can be nanowires and nanotubes, uh, and there are some that cannot be. And there's been a lot of attention, for example, in growing semiconductor nanowires and oxide nanowires. And in the case of growing with a catalyst, uh, that catalyst acts to uh, essentially uh, create the starting point and promote growth of this anisotropic crystal. And the same thing happens when you grow a carbon nanotube, and uh, it's, the, it's the details of the carbon lattice, the fact that carbon wants to be hexagonal, that makes it hollow rather than solid, as you would have, for example, in a silicon nanowire, which has the bulk lattice structure of bulk silicon. And then uh, we'll also touch on at the end today or, or, or tomorrow about how there are some emerging methods, for example, to grow two-dimensional structures, for example, sheets of graphene. Essentially, by doing the same thing that you do for nanotube growth, only understanding how carbon organizes if you have not a catalyst particle, but a flat metal surface where you precipitate sheets of carbon from that flat surface or organize networks of planar carbon on that flat surface. And overall, in terms of you know, how we might make structures that are one-dimensional, that have a length much longer than their diameter, there are a whole bunch of different methods. And uh, I think this is, uh, I forgot the site here, but it's, uh, this is in the review paper that's in the extra set of readings. Uh, but just to provide 
an overview here, you know, this kind of says all, what are all the ways that we can make a, a, a small piece of material much longer than it is wide. So for example, if we had a way to you know, guide the growth on a particular crystal direction, so uh, taking advantage of, for example, a difference in surface energy from one face to the other. Uh, or in case B, if we were able to confine the growth using a liquid droplet such that we were precipitating out the material in one direction. Now this principle of getting one, one direction to grow faster than the other and therefore make the structure longer than the other can also be applied by, say, having a small piece of material and putting a molecule on one side of the surface so it prevents growth in one direction and then we allow growth in the other direction. Similarly, instead of having a chemical uh, restriction on the side here, we could have a physical restriction. We could make a substrate with a whole bunch of small channels, and we could just fill that substrate with the material we want, and then we would end up with a structure that uh, essentially is the shape of this cavity. And then we could remove this cavity, and we would have our structure remaining. We could also, for example, take zero-dimensional structures, we could take nanoparticles, and if we had a way to hook them together in a chain, then we might be able to leave a, a nanowire or sort of a string of pearls, and maybe we could heat it up afterwards and we could form a structure where they're more connected. And as a final example, we could take you know, a larger piece of material and we could cut it down into smaller pieces and therefore make nanowires by more of a top-down method. So we've already seen, by example, two lectures ago, uh, a case of this, where, uh, for example, we discussed uh, the precipitation of atoms from the vapor phase on a surface, and after you form clusters of a critical size, if you're working with a crystal that has uh, the tendency to grow anisotropically in a particular direction, you may, for example, form solid nanowires. So this is, to me, is an example of guided growth in a particular crystal direction. Today we're going to focus a lot on this catalyst-mediated process, or this droplet-mediated process. Uh, where we'll have carbon nanotubes or semiconductor nanowires growing from this droplet by uh, adsorption of a precursor on the surface of the droplet and then precipitation of the solid from the opposite side. We saw one example of this in, la in the last lecture where we discussed this research from Berkeley where uh, they were able to grow these cadmium selenide tetrapod structures by understanding a particular molecule that pacifates a certain surface of the crystal structure. And as a result, they were able to control the growth of these arms so you don't get a lot of fattening of the arms, but you get a lot of lengthening of the arms. And we discussed the top-down methods already in lecture 12, just in general, higher resolution lithography, for example, going to the limits of tens of nanometers, can certainly carve out wires and arrays of wires uh, with the desired shapes that we have. However, remembering the dimensional limits to those processes, we can't approach the dimensions controllably of single nanometers, which is where a lot of the efforts in controlled synthesis of nanotubes and nanowires are. And there are also other issues in terms of the defects and the orientation of the wires that may not be addressed if you took a film and you carved it out by top-down lithography. And then after the exam, we'll talk about self-assembly and we'll understand, for example, how we might take, uh, take precursors, take nano, as nanoparticles or, you know, other sense, take, maybe take nanowires and hook them together to make structures in this fashion. And now next I'll talk about a couple examples of this method before we move on to the focus of today, which will be growing from particles. So just to, you know, try to provide a, a complete picture as discussed by the review papers, it's possible to use physical templates to create uh, one-dimensional structures, for example, by using fil thin film deposition and, for example, taking a, a substrate that you've etched terraces into and depositing a film from a glancing angle or doing the same thing and getting it down into the bottoms of trenches. You could also, for example, if, if there was a substrate that you made with alternating layers of one material and the other, and you had a way of selectively absorbing a precursor to the surface, you could make one-dimensional structures like so. And you could also, for example, assemble particles on, uh, on steps like this, taking advantage of the fact that the particles may preferentially absorb to the corners where there would be uh, an energetically favorable situation for the particles to stick on two faces. 
So these kind of schematic approaches we won't talk about more, but it's generally possible to combine, you know, methods of lithography and methods of film deposition and aspects of self-assembly that we'll describe later to kind of put things together to be elongated in a whole bunch of configurations. And it's also possible, for example, to create templates. If you imagine having a silicon wafer and etching a large array of very narrow holes in it, and then you know, filling that template with a second material, and then dissolving the template to produce a small amount of wires. And this is a very versatile approach. If you can fill the template with different materials, uh, you can create precursors to oxides in solution, or you could, for example, deposit uh, carbon by pyrolysis, uh, kind of analogous to the way we'll see graphene growth happening later, and you can make small amounts of tubes. Uh, these methods have been versatile, but I'm not going to talk about them much more because uh, you make a small quantity of the material, and because you have to take away the template, you kind of lose its organization. So there are other methods, for example, for making large quantities of the material in bulk. If you want you know, grams or kilograms or tons, you have a powder, and that's not oriented, but you have a whole lot of it. Or there are methods for directly controlling the orientation on a substrate that we'll talk about later, where you wouldn't have to make this template and take the template away. But you know, one example, uh, there's been a lot of research on this method because of its versatility. And one uh, example that you can look at in the Meng paper if you're interested uh, is able to create uh, a template uh, out of aluminum oxide that has these kind of Y-shaped pores. And we won't talk about how uh, these, these, this template is made, but suffice to say you start with an aluminum layer and by an electrochemical etching process, by controlling the voltage, you can create these kind of Y-shaped channels vertically in the layer. And then they put a metal layer on top of this now aluminum oxide that's oxidized because of the anodization and are able to uh, electrochemically deposit or electrodeposit metal in this, these trenches. And then they can fill it up by controlling the deposition rate of the metal into the pores to a certain depth. And then they can uh, change the process and grow nanotubes from these metal structures that are within the channels. And they're able to make these arrays of interesting branched structures where you have a top consisting of, uh, of, of metal and then this Y junction like so. And then you have a bottom uh, consisting of a carbon structure. And here you can see the uh, junction between the nanotube that's made in the second step and the metal structure that's made in the first step. And they suggest in this paper that by controlling this strategy for uh, building uh, layers up and controlling this branching based on the template, you can create a whole bunch of, uh, of, of different uh, architectures, for example, with a carbon section, a metal section, a carbon section, uh, these three, you know, and so on. You can follow these things around by having straight segments and branch segments of each type of material. So this is a material that could be of interest as an electrical contact or, for example, as a sensor or a battery if you have a lot of surface area and you're able, for example, to contact to this metal, these metal structures and have them intrinsically well connected to a carbon structure that would have a different functionality. Something, a kind of strategy like this could also be, you know, uh, an interesting uh, kind of project topic if you suggested a new way to make some hierarchical unique structure with a particular property, uh, something analogous to this is something that, uh, that would be a nice topic for investigation. But, uh, you know, certainly there's been a lot more work on studying the catalytic growth of, uh, of nanowires and nanotubes from catalyst particles. Uh, because of the ability to go to much finer sizes, to basically take the structures into the quantum size regime. The limitations of the processes that make these pores don't get us down to the sizes that are needed to study size-dependent properties, as well as the ways, uh, without going into detail, that these structures are filled uh, also create some sacrifices in their structural quality. So we're going to focus on the more ideal methods of using this nanoparticle catalyst to uh, synthesize the structures. And that will also pick up on our understanding from the past two lectures on how to make nanoparticles. So to get into this uh, example of making nanotubes and nanowires, you know, using a catalyst and using other methods,
there are a lot of materials that can be made into one dimensional structures. And we don't need to know all the materials that can be made into nanotubes and nanowires, but uh, we want to realize that, uh, that you know, in the context of solid nanowires, uh, there are a lot of semiconductors, for example, silicon and silicon germanium, cadmium selenide, cadmium tellionide, and telluride, and zinc oxide, and so on, that are made by this catalytic growth process, by the principle we'll discuss in a minute of having a, a nanoparticle of metal uh, as a, essentially a reactor that facilitates the dissolution and precipitation of the wire material. But if you think by you know, the vapor solid method, or for example by the template method that we just saw, you can in principle make a one-dimensional crystal of any material that you can carve into a small wire. And there's certainly been a lot of studies of other materials beyond what we'll uh, discuss today. And in comparison between nanowires and nanotubes, in general, you can make a lot more things into solid nanowires than you can make into nanotubes, or can intrinsically grow into nanotubes, because a smaller subset of the materials intrinsically wants to be hollow, or wants to assemble into a planar lattice, for example, as carbon does grow into a nanotube. So uh, the two main examples of uh, catalytically grown nanotubes are carbon nanotubes, and that should be a capital S tungsten disulfide tubes, which I think we saw as an example uh, in a mechanical property uh, lecture earlier in the term. And by the templating method, if you just cover the sidewalls of the template using, uh, or cover the sidewalls of the template, or make a core shell structure, we'll see an example of that, you can, you know, use this general strategy to make tubes out of a lot of other materials. But in the context of the catalytic process, which will be our focus, only materials that want to be sheets will intrinsically produce a tube uh, from a solid nanoparticle catalyst. And we're going to use the term catalyst to refer to, you know, these nanoparticles that have surface and or bulk solubility for the precursor or a dissociated precursor that we supply in the CVD process. And it could be argued from the formal, you know, terms of the chemistry and reactions, whether or not these particles are technically catalysts or whether they're just growth sites that facilitate self-organization of the structure. But, you know, we'll use the term catalyst because, because it's the one that's used most frequently. And in the classical case of decomposing a precursor, that, uh, that, that uh, a catalyst is, a, is, a, is something that reduces the activation energy of the process and facilitates the formation of something that would not otherwise form. And, and one of the things that's, that's driving interest in synthesis of semiconductor nanowires is, you know, as we might expect from our knowledge of nanoparticles, uh, if you change the diameter of a semiconductor nanowire, you can change its optical properties. So this chart just shows the bulk band gap of a whole bunch of different semiconductors. And you could imagine, that, you know, in a, just in a general fashion, if you could execute this process of size-dependent optical properties for a variety of these semiconductors, you could have a library of materials that facilitates tunable optical properties or different specific optical properties uh, over a very wide range. So this is something of a broad interest for optoelectronic devices, things such as lasers and LEDs, and also uh, energy devices such as photovoltaics. And we won't have time to talk about a lot of the specific optical applications of nanowires, but uh, you know, as a reference, we can uh, draw a parallel to the characteristics of quantum dots, for example, in now realizing how the diameter of a nanowire may change its optical properties. And that's a reason why the control of the diameter is very important. Also, in the case of an electronic device, such as a transistor, if the, cha if, the, if, the, the, if the diameter affects the band gap, then the transistor operation is going to be affected by the diameter of the structure. So in this regard, growing monodispersed nanowires on a substrate uh, or growing them elsewhere and depositing them on a substrate is a very important requirement for our processes that make uh, these structures. And there are a whole bunch of other properties of semiconductors for particular applications that also drive you know, the choice of which nanowire you would make and also have driven researchers to make different types of nanowires rather than just silicon, for example. So the process uh, that's generally called v VLS or vapor liquid solid uh, 
uh, for growth of an of a anisotropic crystal has been studied for over 40 years. And, and in, in 1965, uh, Wagner and Ellis published a series of papers where they studied uh, an observation that if they had a silicon wafer and they had a small particle of gold on this wafer and they heated it up in an atmosphere containing a silicon uh, containing vapor, they were able to grow a crystal in a particular direction by precipitation of solid silicon from this particle. And as we'll see today, we now have a much bigger understanding of how and why this happens, and also are able to observe it at much smaller sizes. When Wagner and Ellis were studying this, they were, they were in fact uh, growing microcrystals. They were growing things with diameters of a fraction of a millimeter, but by the same principle as we'll see for nanowires today. And perhaps they realized that the catalyst was having a special role in promoting the progress of the reaction from the gas phase into the solid phase. Because if you didn't have this particle here and you just exposed the silicon wafer to the gaseous precursor, you wouldn't grow whiskers and you probably wouldn't get uh, any uh, appreciable silicon deposition. And it's called the, the, the vapor liquid solid or VLS process because they were assuming uh, and, and, and observing that uh, you're going from silicon in the vapor phase to silicon in the liquid phase liquid phase. This was a gold silicon liquid, as we'll see in a minute, and then to the solid phase. So this, uh, this, this particle here, uh, what we're calling a catalyst, facilitated a transformation of silicon from the vapor to the liquid to the solid, hence the term VLS. And when I used the term vapor solid for zinc oxide growth, I was saying that the zinc oxide precursor is going from the vapor directly to the solid. So we didn't have this catalyst in the liquid phase like so. And if we think about the mechanism in a, a bit more detail, we can say that depending on the type of nanostructure we're growing, whether it's a semiconductor wire or a particular semiconductor or oxide or a carbon nanotube, for example, uh, we want to generalize this process as working for all the cases. But appreciate that we may have a different precursor or mixture of precursors. You know, here I'm just representing A and B M, for example, for CH4 for methane or for SiH4 for silane. And that the path of incorporation of the precursor atoms into the final structure may be complex and may differ. So, for example, the precursor might uh, first adsorb on the surface and diffuse across the surface and then over the particle and into the structure or it might go over and in and then into the structure, or it might absorb directly onto the particle, and then it could either diffuse by surface diffusion or bulk diffusion. And in any particular case, you might have a mixture of these different paths, uh, and you might have one path that is dominant. And we'll see examples later of how in the case of, say, uh, carbon nanotube growth, research has been done to understand based on the relationship between the growth rate of the structures and the conditions such as temperature or pressure, which of these steps dominates, basically understanding how the, uh, what the activation energy of those processes is and, 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 and relating that to the schematic type here. And then the picture on the right also is kind of drawn up for, for a nanotube but can apply to uh, all one-dimensional structures. Uh, uh, it's important to know that the catalyst particle can reside at the base of the structure or at the tip of the structure during the growth process. So over here, it's kind of shown what's called base growth, where you start with your particles on the substrate, and then, uh, and then the, the structure nucleates, and then it grows, and the catalyst remains at the bottom, and the new material is added at the bottom. Uh, uh, the same process can happen if you have the particle sitting at the top of the structure and just in that case now the particle is moving and you're adding new material by bringing the precursor in onto the surface of the particle which is above. And the, whether, the, whether the particle is at the tip or at the base depends generally on the materials combination in the process, namely the uh, adhesion between the particle and the substrate. So if, for example, Imagine starting the process where you have this particle with no structure on it and it, it gets super saturated with the precursor and it starts to spit out its crystal. And if the crystal uh, has a very favorable interaction with the substrate, more so than the particle, 
it might push the particle above and cause this tip growth to happen. If the opposite case is true, that the particle strongly likes the substrate, but the structure you know, likes it less, then it might be favorable for the particle to stay on the substrate and for the structure to grow up to establish the base growth mode. So we're not going to talk about how you might switch between the two, but the strength of the interaction between the particle and the substrate generally determines whether base growth or tip growth happens. And certain systems, for example, carbon nanotube growth are, are more often base growth, and other systems, for example, semiconductor nanowire growth, are more often tip growth. And we'll see those even from pictures of the structures. You sometimes see a bright spot at the tip of the tube or at the tip of the nanowire, and you can identify that as the catalyst particle that, for example, rides up at the top or stays down at the bottom. <clears throat> and in the, in the case of, for example, growth of semiconductor nanowires, uh, what Wagner and Ellis were doing back in 1965 was that they were observing what we now know in much more detail now, uh, that they formed a liquid solution of gold and silicon because you form what's known as a eutectic between gold and silicon at elevated temperature. So uh, gold melts at about 1064 C and silicon melts at about 1414 C. But if you have gold and silicon together, you form what's known as a binary eutectic at a much lower temperature, just above 360 C. Which means that if you have a gold particle, and let's, let's forget about all effects of size on melting temperature for now, if you have you know, even just a film of gold, and you have that in contact with silicon, or you have that in the presence of a silicon vapor at a temperature above 360, then it's favorable to dissolve silicon into the gold and form a liquid. And that liquid has a composition of about 18%. And so how uh, these silicon crystals are grown and how a lot of silicon nanowires are grown is by bringing gold and silicon in proximity. For example, having your gold dot and having a silicon precursor in the vapor and, and operating under conditions where you first supersaturate the gold particle with silicon, form this liquid gold silicide droplet and then cause precipitation of a crystal from the particle. So as the concentration of silicon in the particle gets supersaturated, then you end up uh, issuing the solid from the particle and the gold silicon liquid droplet acts as this kind of reactor, which is absorbing silicon from the gas phase and then precipitating it out as a nanowire. And depending on the conditions of the process, and the type of, of structure you're looking at, you, know, you might see different configurations of interfaces between the wire and the particle. Uh, and, and these details are, are, are somewhat beyond our scope, but suffice to say that for different catalysts and different crystallographic structures, you may have different uh, orientations, crystal orientations of the wire. And this can depend on the uh, type of catalyst you use, or the conditions of the process, the temperature and pressure, different temperatures and different pressures might favor growth of crystals in different orientations. And something that's also a, a, a very current topic is, for example, understanding what controls the formation of defects or the formation of grain boundaries in these wires. It's non shown here, but sometimes the orientation of the atoms will flip and form what's called a twin boundary, where it's not really a grain boundary, but it's kind of a mirroring of the structure across a particular plane. And understanding how and why those boundaries form is really one of the topics that it's the, the, that it's the, the current edge of this type of research. But you know, the take home point from this slide is that the classical method of growing one dimensional structures from these catalyst particles is that you form a liquid solution of your uh, key precursor atom and your catalyst particle and then you precipitate that out into a crystal. And as is suggested in the problem set in problem three, you can imagine that uh, if you can change the conditions of this process versus time, you can build heterostructures. So, we just discussed the process of starting with a metal particle or a metal droplet on a substrate and supplying the precursor such that you form a, a liquid alloy and growing the nanowire from the substrate. So now we're, we're seeing the case of tip growth where the particle is at the top. Uh, you can imagine that by, for example, oscillating the conditions of the process versus time, you could create a segmented wire or a super lattice wire where you know, maybe it had a segment of one material and a segment of another material. 
Another way that one could create a heterostructure, a heterostructure being by definition just a structure consisting of two materials uh, together, would be to, for example, grow uh, the nanowire uh, you know, with one segment like shown up at the top here, and then uh, change the process conditions so you deposit a second material on the outside of the wire. So maybe you introduce a gas that doesn't diffuse into the catalyst, but will want to will want to will want to grow on the outside. And there you can make a structure with a core of one material and a shell of another material. And for example, this has been employed by Charles Lieber's group at Harvard to uh, make. Uh, core shell nanowires that consist of a core of silicon and a shell of germanium. So uh, Lieber's group uh, uh, was the first uh, a group that I know of, uh, and, and this happened in the early to mid-1990s, to take the previous work by Wagner and Ellis for growth of silicon microcrystals and show that it can be used to grow silicon nanowires. And they did this first by creating uh, gold nanoparticles in solution, smaller than 10 nanometers in diameter, and then spraying them into a, a furnace where they had the silane precursor and showing that they were able to dissolve and precipitate a silicon nanowire. And with a lot of subsequent work, they came up with this process where uh, you first grow a silicon nanowire by precipitation from a gold droplet, and then you insert it into another atmosphere or change the atmosphere downstream, so you grow a, a shell of uh, another material, in this case germanium or silicon germanium, on the surface. And then you can do another process where you just deposit a silicon film on the outside, and generally this is a strategy to make core shell structures of these particular materials. And then by analysis, they were uh, able to use a TEM to take a cross-sectional picture of the structure. And here they had a core of silicon and a shell, uh, or in this case, uh, I guess they're talking about having a, a core of germanium and then an outer layer of, an outer layer of, of, of silicon here. Uh, and uh, so a similar process, sorry, I got it reversed first. So now they were growing germanium from a gold particle and they were depositing a thin layer of amorphous silicon on the surface. And you can see that the germanium is crystalline and the wire was growing in this direction and the silicon is an amorphous shell because you don't see the lattice fringes here. And they were able to profile by, uh, by energy dispersive, uh, dispersive x-ray analysis in the TEM, the relative concentrations of silicon and germanium as a function of distance across this picture. So you can, they've color coded the uh, germanium here in red and the silicon in blue, and you can see that the concentration of germanium drops in the center where you have, or, or, or silicon drops in the center where you have this germanium core. And uh, it could be said that you know, because the beam is going across here in the center, you're measuring not only the germanium in the core, but the silicon on the top and the bottom. Uh, uh, and, and that's why you have a mixture of them in the center. And then over here, you're just measuring the core material, the silicon, and you're not capturing any of the germanium from the outside. And for example, their demonstration in this paper was to take uh, this core shell wire and use lithography to integrate it and create a transistor structure. And with further work, they created wires that had, for example, a, a p-type silicon core in this case, a germanium layer, a silicon oxide layer, and another germanium layer. And by controlling the doping of these different layers, just by controlling the atmosphere in their process, they suggested that you could make a transistor where the gate electrode, which in a traditional transistor is a planar electrode underneath, was actually one of the outer layers. And then you can see that, you know, as, 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 as you may know, a transistor typically has three electrodes, the source and the drain and the gate, and they connected the source and drain electrodes to the red uh, secondary core here, and then they connected the gate electrode to the outside germanium layer. And we, won't need to dis we don't need to discuss the performance of this device, but this is an example how they propose to use this novel coaxial structure uh, enabled by this core shell synthesis process to create a new type of device. And there's a, a lot of interest uh, moving forward in uh, creating hybrid structures consisting of different types of nanostructures. So, uh, so 
because we know, for example, a fair amount about the growth of carbon nanotubes or the synthesis of, of nanowires, we can combine their properties. And that's what guided, for example, the core shell work or this example here. And one thing that can be done is, for example, growth of a vertically aligned carbon nanotube forest. And we'll see actually how this organizes later. And then a secondary process that uses the vapor solid mechanism to grow zinc oxide nanowires on the surfaces of the nanotube. So instead of having a flat substrate on which you grow nanowires, you can uh, use, for example, a nanotube forest as the substrate. And if you take uh, a, a nanotube bundle out of this forest and look at it in the TEM, you'll find that the, you, you've grown uh, zinc oxide wires off the surface of the, of the nanotubes. And further examination in the TM would lead us to see that you have uh, an interface between the oxide and the carbon, and that the nanowires, the zinc oxide nanowires, grow in the uh, 100 direction and have the same characteristics of bulk zinc oxide and the same growth direction of zinc oxide wires that are grown on a flat substrate. So, without more details of what the precursors and so on are here, that's not important. Suffice it to say that we can think of one set of structures as a substrate for growth of another set of structures. And one uh, topic uh, that is of possible interest for these types of hybrids is, for example, creating electrodes for batteries where you can combine, uh, for example, the electrical conductivity of the nanotubes over a large surface area with the properties of a, a crystal that, for example, may be able to store lithium. And so another, this is another example of a type of material that might be a topic for a project, where you may suggest a novel design for a battery electrode or a solar cell electrode and discuss how it may be synthesized and then how its properties may relate to, for example, the density and diameter and characteristics of the nanowires uh, grown, uh, grown, grown on the surface of the nanotubes. And the principle, the kind of guiding principle here is that you can take the properties of one structure and combine them with the properties of the other structure to achieve some new type of functionality. So those two examples are a bit beyond uh, you know, the, the basic growth discussion that we're going to have now, but I wanted to show them to suggest where the kind of forefront is in combining the synthesis of different types of materials. And now that we're through that, we'll talk a bit about you know, CVD methods for growing these structures and what apparatuses are used and what the performance of the actual catalyst particles is like. So in general, you know, we've seen fragments of how you can create nanostructures by, for example, you know, ablation using lasers or condensation of clusters and so on. And, 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 and the world, in terms of research and commercialization, has settled on chemical vapor deposition as the way to make these structures, in general because it's a relatively low temperature process uh, compared to, uh, for example, arc and laser methods that require, say, two to 3,000 C. Uh, CVD can happen over a few hundred C. It can be adapted to a wide variety of structures based on the choice of the catalyst and the reactant. So you know, our picture of having a nanoparticle and having a precursor seems quite general, except for the choice of those details. Uh, and uh, we'll see that you know, typically these structures can have uh, low defect density because we have controlled crystallization of the nanotube or nanowire. The growth process can be quite rapid. You have kinetics of growth that can produce nanotubes, for example, at tens of microns per second or faster, or nanowires at, uh, at a rate as high as that or lower if you want it to be slower. And you can grow the structures directly on substrate, such as silicon wafers. And you can also make very large reactors and create large volumes of powders. So this general method of having a nanoparticle catalyst can happen with, with, with particles in the gas phase or particles on a substrate. And you can have just one nanostructure growing for a device, or you can have a kilogram of them growing in volume. And that's why this general method has pervaded through research in other, in, in other ways. And uh, from an from a, you know, engineering uh, apparatus design point of view, there are several different systems that are typically used for CVD growth of nanotubes and nanowires. And the one that is most typically used, in, in, you know, particularly in laboratories for you know, small uh, growth processes, is just a horizontal tube furnace where you have a sealed atmosphere, uh, uh, typically in a quartz tube or a ceramic tube. And that's surrounded by a furnace that is heated uh, resistively or, or heated inductively. And in that, in that uh, 
furnace, you have your substrates containing the catalyst. It can be a powder in a dish or it can be a silicon substrate, for example, with the particles on it. And uh, by configuration, I'll refer to this as a horizontal tube furnace with a fixed catalyst, meaning the catalyst is not moving with time with respect to the process. And I call it fixed because there are also methods using floating catalysts or using catalysts in the vapor phase. And that's the method, uh, for example, that I refer to in the case of Lieber's group growing the silicon nanowires from gold nanoparticles, where you may have a furnace that's vertically oriented and you could inject a mixture of catalyst particles and your precursor. In this case, the, the article was talking about nanotubes, so they're saying it's a carbon source. And by interaction of the precursor and the particles through the heated zone, the structures will grow, and you can collect them at the output. Another kind of take on this process is what's called a fluidized bed method, where you're not really dropping the catalyst from the, from the bottom, but you have uh, for example, some container inside the furnace, and you're passing the catalyst or the, ca the gas through the catalyst in a controlled fashion. And the fluid dynamics of this packed bed lead to very uniform thermal and chemical conditions. Uh, and, and these methods are used to make large quantities of powders of nanotubes in industry. And then, taking from a lot of the semiconductor synthesis processes, there's also work on using plasmas to synthesize nanotubes and nanowires. And we won't talk in detail about plasmas, but the idea is to use an electric field in combination with elevated temperature to control the dissociation of the gas species and or to control the heating of the substrate. And we'll see an example of this in a minute. But for example, now you would have your substrate with the catalyst on it, and that could be, for example, between two electrodes where a voltage is applied. And that voltage can dissociate the gas, or it can, for example, have an effect on orienting the structures on the substrate. So if you had you know, a classic horizontal tube furnace to grow, grow, grow nanotubes or nanowires, it would just be you know, essentially a, a box sitting on the table, and, and that would include a system for controlling the temperature of the furnace by controlling the temperature of this heating coil and having a temperature sensor either inside the furnace or close to the point of action on the outside of the tube, as well as electronics to control the flows uh, so you could issue a you know, pre-configured program. And for example, a you know, typical sequence would be just what you would expect. You would put your sample into the furnace, ramp it up to a desired temperature, hold that temperature, and then let it cool off. And the time scales of you know, benchtop furnaces for growing films of nanotubes and nanowires are tens of minutes. Uh, it might take you know, 10 minutes to heat up or 20 minutes to heat up, and you might grow the structures for that same number of minutes. And then, you know, depending on whether you kept the furnace shut or you opened it up, the same time scales might exist to uh, cool the furnace. But that's an idea of how long it would take to grow a structure like this. So in a lot of academic labs, these pictures are from uh, Tsinghua University in Beijing. Uh, the, you, you would have a, a furnace like this, and this is actually a pretty sophisticated one for an academic lab, but something that could fit uh, substrates on the scale of centimeters or inches and grow films of nanostructures on those substrates. So this is a picture of, uh, of uh, silicon or carbon nanotubes grown on four-inch silicon wafers using this furnace right here. And in large-scale production of powders and of, na of nanotubes, these same kinds of systems actually get very, very large. And there are companies that produce, you know, you could see this is about two guys tall, uh, large tube furnaces. And these actually feed powder of catalyst through themselves at a, on a continuous process by rotating the tube. And so uh, what happens here is there's a mechanism to feed in a catalyst powder. The tube uh, rotates slowly and is slightly downhill and has kind of like a screw, uh, screw configuration on the inside. And that is heated. And you can imagine the catalyst going through the, 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 the furnace like so from one side to the other. And you could load it in, let it go, and take it out. Or you might have a continuous feeder mechanism to uh, introduce it and, and, and issue it out of the opposite side. And in design of these large systems, you, know, you can create, uh, for example, very large quantities of structures. This one can make 100 tons of carbon nanotubes a year if it's run 24 hours a day. And there are also some important construction issues. For example, uh, you can't get quartz tubes because of the limits to uh, current quartz tube manufacturing of 
uh, of, of sizes larger than 12 or 14 inches in diameter. So often these uh, reactors have stainless steel tubes rather than quartz tubes. And you have to understand the reaction of the atmosphere with the tube material uh, to make that change. <clears throat> in terms of reactors to do uh, plasma enhanced growth of, uh, of nanostructures, uh, as I showed before, you typically have uh, a configuration with electronics to maintain a voltage in proximity to the substrate in addition to a temperature, as well as uh, uh, electronics to control the gas flows and so on. And typically, when a voltage is applied to generate a plasma, these methods are done at reduced pressures. Uh, and so you have a vacuum system uh, as well. And you can have different types of plasmas, like you can have you know, different types of plasmas for film deposition. You can apply a plasma directly at the substrate, uh, which would be called a direct plasma, or you can have a plasma away from the substrate that may just help break down the gas and change the nature of the reactants. And that plasma, if it's close to the substrate, can, can, can affect the composition of the precursor, uh, and it can also, for example, affect the growth of the structures. So, for example, in the case of, uh, this is showing an example of growth of carbon nanotubes from nickel catalyst particles, the electric field that exists in this gap can actually exert a force on the particle, and in this study it was shown uh, that they were able to pull the particle up from the substrate and initiate tip growth of oriented nanofibers by the field-induced force existing from this plasma. So we're not, we don't need to talk about how the plasma is operating and how it's dissociating the gas, but suffice to say that implementation of an electric field in a system can let us uh, control the nature of the precursor, its decomposition, and can also let us apply some external energetics that might control the growth and orientation of the structures. And here are some pictures uh, of uh, plasma-enhanced growth of uh, these kind of conical nanofibers from lines of individual particles that were created by electron beam lithography or created by a contact printing process for these lines. And you can see here the individual structures that were grown by this process or the lines of the structures. An important point that's, that's not, not, not shown here is that if we didn't use a plasma to grow the structures vertically, to apply a field to pull on the catalyst particles, the structures wouldn't be so well aligned. And one of the challenges in growing isolated structures with controlled orientation is that the ability to, to, to grow them in an isolated fashion it gets harder as their diameter gets smaller. Because as their diameter gets smaller, they are, you know, their, their stiffness is lower, and they're more prone to thermal vibration in the atmosphere and also interactions due to van der Waals forces. So this just is an example of uh, a field-assisted growth of isolated vertical nanofibers by, uh, by patterning of different catalyst particles on a substrate like so. <clears throat> and in the case of, uh, of bulk growth, of powder growth, it's also possible to use this fluidized bed reactors that we saw uh, a schematic of before, where here we just see a bit more detail of how uh, you have a, a center section of the furnace that's kind of packed with, uh, with catalyst and uh, gas get, goes through this packed bed and you have a fairly uniform distribution of chemical conditions and then the gas comes out the top and the gas is scrubbed and is vented to the atmosphere. And for example, here's a picture of a large fluidized bed reactor, which is actually in an academic lab uh, in, in China. Uh, and, uh, and they were using these to synthesize, this to synthesize very large quantities of multi-walled nanotube powders. And they had this container that, uh, that, that, that was shaped like a nanotube that they filled with nanotubes. Uh, and, uh, and this uh, could, if they ran it all the time, uh, it could make 30 kilograms an hour, and that could have made uh, about 250 tons a year, uh, but they didn't run it, run it this frequently. Uh, in fact, it was so big, they said, that, uh, that it took two days to cool down because there was so much thermal mass here. And they were doing research on mixing nanotubes and polymers for composites, and they wanted to understand the growth process and understood that, understand how it related to the properties, so that's why they were interested in making such large quantities of nanotubes for their own use. So now I want to transition into 
uh, a discussion of the, the, the basic growth mechanisms of these nanotubes and nanobars, how the interface behaves, how the structure nucleates, and how we can think about that as applying to all kinds of configurations. You know, we have seen this slide before, and, and, and I'll just remake the point that you know, now we can see that using different uh, configurations of the substrate and uh, different configurations of the catalyst, we might be able to make you know, isolated nanotubes into things like transistors, or might be able to make large quantities of nanotubes for dispersion into uh, to, uh, materials such as plastics. And these can enable a large number of applications. And for example, there are particular constraints on the synthesis process that uh, are need to be approached or employed to enable applications in these different directions. So for example, the ability to grow very long nanotubes is important for making high performance composites or things like thermal interfaces or membranes based on forests of nanotubes. Whereas the ability to control diameter very well and, and perhaps later on control chirality is important for making transistors with very specific electrical properties and making a high performance memory and electrical interconnects. And in the top left here relating to the previous slide, we're interested in precise placement of of individual nanotubes or small numbers of nanotubes on substrates, whereas in this case we're interested in organization of uh, larger numbers of tubes in things like forests or things like oriented yarns and fibers. And I hope we can now appreciate how the conditions of the synthesis process, not only the, you know, the chemistry and the type of catalyst, but also the way our substrate and our process is designed is incredibly important for engineering whether we want to be over here or over here and also shows us why uh, applications such as plastics containing nanotubes as conductive additives have been commercialized for a long time because that is really the simplest embodiment where we just have a large population of tubes growing in a powder but we don't have very specific control over their orientation uh, or their uh, or, or you could say high monodispersity in their length or their diameter. <clears throat> so if we break down you know, the process of growing a film of nanotubes or nanowires on a substrate, uh, I like to think that it has three important stages. The first is creating the catalyst particles, and, and this could be by a process that we, we know about already for you know, creating nanoparticles. And, and now we're using these nanoparticles to seed the growth of nanotubes or nanowires. And the control of the organization, of the size, of the chemical state, for example, of these particles is incredibly important to the next step. And so now using these nanoparticles as templates, our second step is to nucleate the nanotubes of the nanowires. So to understand the conditions that start the growth of highly monodisperse or the desired size distribution of one-dimensional structures from these zero-dimensional structures. And you can imagine that the yield of these processes is not always perfect. In some cases, you get one that's a dud and doesn't grow a nanotube or a nanowire, and the others uh, grow them well. And for example, also, the sizes of these particles may practically or likely will be different due to the dispersity of the particle preparation process, and different sizes of catalyst nanoparticles will probably grow nanotubes or nanowires at different rates, and that's really important. And after we nucleate the structure, uh, we want to move into the growth regime, and like we did for nanoparticles, we're thinking more about how to continue the growth of the structures in a controlled fashion rather than form them to the start. So now let's think about how the nanowire or nanotube would kind of be extruded from the nanoparticle on a continuous basis and understand later on a bit about the role of the stiffness of the individual structures, the strengths of their interactions with one another due to van der Waals forces, and thermal vibration which causes them to whip around at high temperature on how they behave together. And one uh, very you know, practical axis that we want to span is the ability to understand how to grow individual structures, understand how to grow uh, tangled mats or thin films, and understand how to grow vertical structures such as forests shown there. And in general we want to think about a lot of questions that are important for understanding and controlling uh, these structures. And we won't answer all these questions. A lot of these answers are uh, being studied by research, but I think we can frame the questions in context of a lot of the things that we're going to discuss. So we want to know what determines the relationship between the nanostructure and the catalyst. 
and the diameter and maybe the, you know, any, any variations in the diameter of the structure as it grows. And in the case of na carbon nanotubes, understand what controls the chirality, which hasn't been figured out yet. We might want to know whether the catalyst is solid or liquid during the process. Uh, back to the Wagner and Ellis and Lieber example, we were talking about liquid solutions of, of gold and silicon or gold and germanium, but it's now known that this catalyst particle can actually behave in a similar fashion even if it is a solid. And we might want to know what the, the ideal precursors are and how the precursor is incorporated in the catalyst. One can grow carbon nanotubes using pretty much any carbon containing gas as the precursor. You might have to change the temperature, you might have to change the pressure, but we don't really know exactly what molecule sticks at the catalyst and how it breaks down and how it makes its way into the nanotube. And you can imagine for nanotubes and for nanowires, understanding these pathways is going to be really important for thinking about how the structure is built and how that might determine what its crystal orientation or its chirality is. And then we want to look at how the size distribution of the structures evolves due to the nucleation and growth conditions. What limits the lifetime of the catalyst, like how long will the nanotube or nanowire grow for and what makes it stop? And you know, what are the effects of impurities in the atmosphere, like small amounts of oxygen, for example, which is typical when you have a furnace. You can't get all the oxygen out very easily. Uh, and that can affect the, the behavior of the catalyst, it can affect the reactions in the gas phase, and it can affect uh, the interactions between the gas and the catalyst. And this might seem kind of arbitrary for now, but uh, for example, at the end, we'll see that having a small amount of oxygen in the atmosphere that grows silicon nanowires can actually passivate the surface of the wires and prevent the gold particle from shrinking. And if the gold particle shrinks, the nanowire tapers into a cone and you have a, a change in its diameter along its length. And understanding these kind of very mi minute effects in the atmosphere are really important to understanding how to precisely control the size of the structures. And we always have a whole lot of inputs and a whole lot of outputs. So for, for all nanotubes and nanowires and even you know, self-organization and precipitation on the surface, I feel like this generalized picture, although painted out for a carbon nanotube growth and a simulation of that applies, where we first dose the catalyst particle with a supersaturation of the precursor, whether it be in the bulk or on the surface, we overcome a nucleation threshold, and then after that threshold is surpassed, we have gone from the nucleation phase to the growth phase, and we're going uh, from having the structure established to continuous production of the structure from our catalyst particle. So, for example, for carbon nanotubes, it's been shown uh, by a lot of recent studies using high-resolution transmission electron microscopy, sometimes in situ, while heating, the, heating a catalyst and having a carbon source in the atmosphere, that the first stage of nanotube growth is the formation of the cap. So you have a metal island, your metal nanoparticle, which is the catalyst, you organize carbon uh, on the surface of that catalyst. So, for example, uh, carbon diffuses in this zone in general and then precipitates out an initial structure, and that initial structure is the head of the nanotube. And once that cap forms, that is the nucleus of the nanotube, and then it issues out into a cylindrical structure. And you can see here that the particle is changing shape with time and based on the, the state we're in. And how the particle changes shape and how the shape of the particle relates to the structure and the chirality are a lot of things that people are looking at now. But uh, as you can imagine, it's a highly dynamic process and the nucleus of the structure can exert force on the particle and the, uh, the actual uh, attachment between the nanotube and the particle uh, can be important for determining what its structure is, whether it's a, you could say, whether it's an armchair nanotube or whether it's a chiral nanotube. And I think that uh, understanding is what's going to lead us perhaps to understand what controls chirality, but that can't be done so far. <clears throat> and uh, another example is a previous study that shows growth of an individual nano, nanotube from a particle by tip growth. And here the conditions are different, the resolution is lower, uh, and so on, but this is just a, a video that 
shows us how the particle separates itself from the surface and how that process is highly dynamic. The particle changes shape versus time and depends, you know, its, its trajectory is going to depend on where the carbon atoms come in and maybe what else is around it. <clears throat> and this idea of nucleation by a phase segregation, by crossing a sudden threshold from having your supersaturated precursor to having growth of a crystal and having the particle as a reactor also applies to nanowire growth from, uh, from liquid catalyst particles. So uh, we can see a similar picture if we look at a video from uh, 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 studying the growth of silicon nanowires from gold catalysts. So now we're looking in a TEM at gold particles in a silane atmosphere and you're going to see silicon uh, nanowires pop out suddenly. So we are going from the process of dosing the particle with the precursor to the case where it's supersaturated and forms a two phases in contact, a gold silicon eutectic phase and a solid silicon crystal and the wire starts growing outward. And that one branches into two because of the way the particle is attached to the grid. And you see as they go on, they keep, they keep going. And a really interesting uh, phenomena that's predictable just from the basics of absorption is that, uh, as you may have noticed, the small ones nucleate first. Because it can be said that the rate of of incorporation of silicon into the particle is proportional to the surface area of the particle, which is r squared or 4 pi r squared, and the concentration is uh, inversely proportional to the volume. So if you put a fixed quantity of silicon into a particular particle, its concentration is going to just be the fixed amount of silicon divided by the volume. So if you multiply the rate of silicon incorporation by, the con by, by a fixed concentration, you get the answer that uh, the, the rate of supersaturation is inversely proportional to the radius. Because smaller particles have a higher surface area to volume ratio, it takes them less time to reach this critical threshold, and therefore smaller particles nucleate faster, i.e. the red one, number one, uh, grows a wire before number two grows a wire. In this case, it's a difference of about a factor of two to one, and it's directly proportional to A naught, which is the, 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 uh, the calculated surface area of the particles, or the projected surface area in the case of this image. <clears throat> and depending on whether the catalyst actually is a liquid or a solid, you can see other mechanisms of incorporation of the precursor. So uh, in this same study, uh, uh, the growth of silicon nanowires from, uh, from palladium and silicon was also studied. And in the case of uh, palladium and silicon, you don't form a liquid solution, but you form a solid alloy where you have you know, some composition of palladium in context with silicon. But it's still possible to supersaturate this solid with silicon and to precipitate out the nanowire from the catalyst. And so here, it's actually shown that the movement of steps of this interface actually builds the nanowire layer by layer. And this can be seen in a video as well. Where you'll see layers running across the screen. And that's producing the nanowire and the catalyst is moving down. So this mechanism of building the structures by atom by atom is happening whether we're precipitating a crystal out from a liquid or whether we're driving an interface from a solid to a solid. <clears throat> and in general, if we ask the question of whether the catalyst is liquid or solid, uh, the answer can be both depending on the growth conditions for any type of structure. 
So if we looked at the, mel the melting points of a bunch of materials that may typically be used as catalysts for nanotube and nanowire growth, and we applied the melting point theory that we have from several lectures ago, we could, for example, get that for gold, the bulk melting point, meaning large particle size, is 1060 C, as we saw in the phase diagram. And as we go down into the size regime beneath 10 nanometers, we see that we get a significant suppression in the melting point. And in the case of iron and nickel, the curves are different. So, you know, not only do we have to think about whether we're forming a solution and how we're forming a solution of the precursor and the catalyst, but whether the, 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 the base catalyst itself is a solid or a liquid can also come into question depending on the conditions. And in general, these different paths of incorporation of the precursor from the surface or from the bulk depend strongly on temperature. It's often more likely that you have incorporation of the precursor by surface diffusion over the catalyst when you're at lower temperature, and you have incorporation by bulk diffusion when you're at higher temperature, and in fact, when the catalyst can be a liquid, and when you have better motion of the precursor into the particle. So you know, specific examples here aren't, aren't, aren't important beyond this, but the general idea that the melting point of these particles can be suppressed, and that depending on the situation, you can have solid or liquid particles is important for understanding and controlling the growth. And in fact, it's been shown that you know, we saw uh, palladium and we saw silicon or we saw gold as catalysts. In other studies where nanowires are grown uh, under the same conditions, for example, this is a case of growing germanium nanowires from uh, catalyst particles. It's been shown under, the, under otherwise identical conditions, you can grow them when the catalyst is, is liquid or the catalyst is solid. And in this case, when the catalyst is solid, it has a faceted crystalline shape and the growth is slower. And when the catalyst is liquid, it has this spherical shape because it melts and it wants to be a sphere and the growth is faster. And understanding how and why the growth transitions between these two cases is another area for study. And for example, showing, the, showing that the catalyst is solid happens unambiguously from doing electron diffraction on the particle in a TEM while the wire is growing. So in this case, they're studying the growth of a germanium wire and have a single gold particle at the tip. And uh, at 500 uh, at this temperature, they are seeing that the gold particle is remaining solid. And there are a lot of elements that can be catalysts for nanowire growth for particular nanowires. And in, particular, in the particular case of carbon nanotubes, a whole bunch of elements can catalyze nanotube growth or can seed nanotube growth. And uh, in the start of the field, it was discussed that elements transition metals that have a high solubility for carbon or typically, typically grow nanotubes by this VLS mechanism. And more recently, uh, there has been demonstration that metals that don't have a bulk solubility for carbon, such as gold and platinum, can also grow nanotubes under particular conditions. And now it's even being shown that oxide nanoparticles can, uh, can induce growth of nanotubes by surface organization of carbon. So you know, how and why different catalysts grow different nanotubes is not important for us, but suffice to say that by choosing different types of nanoparticles, uh, 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 it's been shown that a lot of the carbon nanotubes can, can be grown from a whole bunch of different materials on which you can organize this cap and on which you can precipitate out a nanotube. And if we now expand from the picture of having a whole bunch of different catalysts to actually depositing the particles, we could, for example, imagine uh, having a liquid solution of particles and dipping in a substrate and depositing the particles on the substrate or, for example, depositing a thin film, as we saw before, and annealing it such that it agglomerates into particles and using that as a means to create the particles on the substrate. So regardless of what the particles are, whether we're growing nanowires or nanotubes, if we're able to make a solution of them or we're able to deposit a thin film of a precursor and control its annealing into particles, we can create a film of particles on a substrate and then we can grow a surface bound film of nanotubes or nanowires. And in general, regardless of how the particles are prepared, it's generally seen for nanotubes and nanowires, the size of the particle determines the diameter of the structure. So in the left column here, we have the diameters of different uh, particle sizes that were created. 
by a solution method and the, a histogram of the diameter distribution here. And on the right side, we have a picture of carbon nanotubes that were grown from particles of this size and then a histogram of the diameter distribution there. So we can see that the a first row where the, the average diameter of the particle is say about three nanometers is yielding carbon nanotubes of reasonably close to that diameter. And as we go up uh, in the particle size, we go up in diameter and up to the third one like so. And in the case of carbon nanotubes, we also see that the structure of the nanotubes changes with diameter. So uh, as we know already, smaller nanotubes are going to have one wall, are going to be single walled. But as we go to larger diameters of catalyst particles and therefore larger diameter na diameters of nanotubes, we're going to go from single walled tubes to multi walled tubes. The crossover from nanotubes that have one wall uh, to two or more walls is typically between two and three nanometers in diameter. And then, in fact, as you go to very large diameters, you can make multi-wall nanotubes with, 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 pretty, with fairly large number of walls. It, you also sometimes get uh, these kind of crossovers between the inner walls that relate to the catalyst going from being very curved to being flatter uh, on the surface. But by changing the diameter of the catalyst and by keeping that diameter stable, one can grow uh, nanotubes of uh, the specific diameter that you want, even though it's not possible to control the chirality yet. And one of the challenges, as you, know, you can imagine from uh, our understanding and observation of the sizes of nanoparticles in solution, is to create catalysts that uh, have particularly small diameters. Uh, you know, we were thinking in the semiconductor synthesis discussion about making particles that were a few nanometers in diameter. If you wanted to make carbon nanotubes that were, say, only one nanometer in diameter, it's very difficult to stably create nanoparticles that are that small. So there have been some different strategies to uh, create alloys of catalysts that can stabilize the diameters of uh, very, very small metal nanoparticles. So, uh, this is a snapshot from work at the University of Oklahoma that uses an alloy of cobalt and molybdenum. And what happens is that when you heat up this alloy, you get a very stable organization of very small uh, cobalt nanoparticles on a molybdenum carbide support that then is favorable for synthesis of, uh, of, of carbon nanotubes of very small diameters, of nanotubes that are in the one to two nanometer size range. And in fact, uh, they see that as they use the same process but increase the temperature or do three different processes at different temperatures, you get different size distributions of nanotubes and because the particles coarsen, because the particles grow to larger size, the diameter of the nanotubes gets larger. And something that's really at, at the forefront of this approach is now they're observing that in the very, very small size range, they see preferential selection of a few chiralities of nanotubes. So not just one particular chirality, but the emergence of a, of a majority of a few chiralities, the 6.5 and the 7.5 chiralities, which are slightly smaller than one nanometer. So this approach uh, in general to create very small uh, monodispersed catalyst particles is being studied as a means of understanding what determines the chirality and if it is possible to create a truly atomically precise catalyst particle and understand how that interface emerges, it might be possible to control the chirality of the nanotubes. So there are a lot of other effects in the process. For example, the diameter of the nanotubes can depend on the rate at which you supply carbon. In, in essence, to thinking about how we were discussing uh, you know, a diffusion-limited uh, growth of nanoparticles in solution where the reaction rate depends on the concentration gradient. There's work that studies, for example, how using an identical process and identical catalyst particles, if you increase the concentration of the gas precursor, precursor you can also increase the diameter of the nanotubes. So this is also a variable that's going to affect the rate at which the precursor is incorporated in the structure and the rate at which the structure grows. And I think with that, I'll stop here. And I'll post all these slides. And then for next time, I'll select a subset of the slides remaining that will finish up this topic. And we'll have half of next time's lecture for the rest of this topic and half of the lecture for uh, exam review and any questions about the exam. So I'll see you all on Wednesday.